Welcome to today's episode of The Square. I'm really excited to be here with Corey Deer, who is the design director for yeah. commercial and data centers. Thank you so much for being here, Corey. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, I want to dive into the data center and the commercial side of things okay. in a minute. We'll put okay. that on hold for a second. Sure. First, I just want to find out like a little bit about... Um, why architecture? Was it something, you know, like, were you doing drawing and doing yeah. Legos growing up? Or is it something that clicked at a certain point? Yeah, so uh, like many architects, I'm sure, uh, one of the biggest things for me was drawing mm -hmm. as a little kid. And um, whether it was in church or like in class when yep. I was getting bored, it was always drawing, uh, you know, Bart Simpson or drawing different <laughs> figures. Um I even made this like weird series of heads with clay <laughs> that I positioned all around my grandmother's house. There's like 20 of them, just strange. That sounds like the beginning of the perfect horror movie. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they were like these strange cartoon heads, That's you know, funny. of different uh, animals and people and stuff like that. And yeah, strange as that, as that was, I guess like, you know, I always thought that art was going to be it for me. Yeah. And then once I got into high school, I kind of thought, well, I don't know if I can really be an artist and make money, you know, yeah. <laughs> put food on the table and stuff. So I was like, architecture is close enough. In high school, that's a really, yeah. that's a really, you know, mature way of thinking about yeah, things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so after high school, mm -hmm. you went to college. So I went to A&M for undergrad. Okay. And after undergrad, uh, I actually worked at Corgan for about three years. And oh, right out of school. Right out of school. Okay. And then um, I did have an internship at Lake Flato when I was in undergrad. Mm -hmm. I just took a semester off and worked there. And then so I came to work at Corgan in 05. And after about three years, I needed to get a master's professional degree right. so I could go get licensed. So then I went to UT after that. Did you, what um, sector were you in when you were here for the three years? So when I was here for the three years, I was with commercial. Okay. So I, I've always been uh, to com on the commercial team right. uh, to some degree. Um, but now actually when I came back, uh, for the third time, um, my third stint at Corgan, um, that's when I worked with Chuck and Joel yeah. and that was specifically on the design side, not really sector oriented right. at that time. So it would be, you know, healthcare one day, um, could be an avi you know, an aviation project the right. next. So that really kind of kept me on my toes. Um, and you've come, you've kind of come full circle back to commercial and yes. data centers. Is there, yes. is there something about the commercial side of architecture that's mm -hmm. appealing? Well, you know, we spend about eight hours a day at work, right. at least most of us. And <laughs> at, uh, at a minimum, at a minimum. <laughs> and, uh, you know, now since we're also doing multifamily, we're mm -hmm. kind of encompassing, you know, where you fall asleep at night, where you wake up, where right. you go to work. So it's kind of the life cycle of a person. So for me, you know, thinking about somebody's day to day is really important and yeah. really interesting. So that's kind of one of the reasons I really enjoy it. I, I remember this has been probably five or six years ago. We were mm -hmm. partnered with uh, some developer mm -hmm. and um, the it was the first time I had heard kind of the mantra of live, work, play, mm -hmm. all being kind of in the same area. Right. Is that new wrapping on an old concept mm -hmm. is that something that's kind of been been having more prominence lately yeah so i would say it's new wrapping on an old concept because if you think about the way you know say an italian mm -hmm. uh small uh city is set up um you know you're going to be walking by a market on your way home right um you know that market might be underneath the office that you work in every day yeah and so that was sort of how we lived as humans you know hundreds of years ago and even if you go back to Pompeii, you know, when Vesuvius erupted in, what is that, 79 AD or, right. or AD or whatever, um, you know, you look at that city and it's an all encompassing, very mixed use um, area. Mm -hmm. And um, we started getting away from that with suburban developments and you had houses kind of segregated from everything right. else. So I would say it's this refocus on getting people back together and getting different uses kind of collapsed into the same environment. So I, I got to imagine COVID not necessarily, I'm sure directly in some ways, mm -hmm. but even indirectly with this idea, this resurgence of people wanting more of a hybrid work environment yep. has yep. lent itself to, uh, you know, an advancement of that idea of you. Mm -hmm. It's way more practical now to kind of mm -hmm. live, work and play in one area. Yeah. And people are very much used to working from home. And they're used to that life kind of hybridizing, you know, as you're saying. So you wake up, you kind of attend to whatever you need to attend to, to the, you know, for the day right. in your private life, while at the same time kind of negotiating what you're doing at work. And I think people got really comfortable with that. They had, 
you know, their pets beside them as they're working. And I feel like now uh, when you think about the workplace, it's really in direct competition with home. Yeah. So when we think about sort of elevating our game, now we're thinking about, okay, what do people have at their home and what would they like to incorporate into their workplace? And can we find ways to make those situations happen? So I think that, you know, it, it may have been a premature swinging of the pendulum a little too far (laughs) one direction. Right. But uh, especially having had kids, like it can be a double edged sword to be working from home. And there's, there's definitely things even like just having these conversations where you have to have a building in our, in our case, a commercial building. Mm -hmm. How has that, that competition, like you Mm -hmm. said, of, of commercial and home changed how you design? Yeah. So, um, you know, touched on the fact that we're doing multifamily now, but, um, you know, this renewed focus on it, it could be a situation where you're designing an apartment, Mm -hmm. but that apartment needs to have its own small workspace. Mm -hmm. That's something that's different uh, when you think about incorporating into a unit design. Yeah. And similarly uh, with workplace, that might mean that you might have more focus on health rooms, outdoor environments, you know, back when you're at home, you could just take your dog for a walk. You could just go outside for a breath of fresh air. Right. That's going to be something that people are going to expect now in the workplace. And, um, you know, you think about the psychology, though, of being at home. You're mentioning the tech companies. Um, you know, how would it be for you just to, you know, spend eight hours a day at home? Right. Never leave, never actually physically interact with coworkers. Yeah. It's all virtual. I would imagine if you did a long-term study on that over the course of 10 years, yeah. you might see some negative uh, psychological effects. Oh, for sure. Just sort of the straining away of yeah. that kind of physical interaction. So I think just imagining, and you know, we, we can sit here and imagine all we want. You know, There are people that study these things and actually right. do real scientific research, but I just have a hunch that yeah. that's going to lead to some negative consequences. So let's talk a little bit about as a design director Mm -hmm. for commercial for data centers. Um, Mm -hmm. Actually, even before we get into that, let's check up. Where do you feel like your passion for the design process is rooted? Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I always think back to whether it was in, you know, elementary school or high school or whatever, it always felt like if it was just an isolated incident, whenever you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I make a project better? Um, you always felt like you had the best ideas in the room that sort of just came with like thinking you're a creative little kid or whatever. Yeah. But what you found out very quickly was when you looked over someone else's shoulder, they saw something that you just didn't see yourself. And it was always this moment of, ah, it was like this painful spear to your heart. You're thinking, okay, maybe I don't have the best ideas, (laughs) but then you sort of negotiate this situation where you're trying to figure out, you know, amongst this scrum of ideas, which one really rises to the top. Yeah. And so it's the, it's not always the best idea wins. It's the way the idea is pitched. And sometimes it just has to do with like the political factors going on in the group. Yeah. So to me, it's like that group dynamic is what makes it really interesting and trying to create a space that feels really safe where people can, you know, say what they need to say and they feel supported. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it could be somebody who just started a week ago and to try to give them the comfort um, of creating a space where they can just say what they need to say and have those ideas stick to the wall. I mean, to me, and that's be where it becomes really interesting. Yeah, yeah, to actually be heard. Is um, when you when you get to these, and inevitably in the creative mm-hmm. process, you're going to have these dry spells, mm-hmm. or even as a, a, a when you collaborate, yeah, where you've got kind of ideas going too broadly, mm-hmm. if you will. How do you both from a team aspect kind of re-inspire in a direction and then Mm -hmm. personally how do you stay inspired well i would say from a team point of view like one thing we tried recently it was really an experiment more than anything else but it was a seven by three uh sketching activity so there was a building um that we were going to wrap essentially taking a very mundane building and putting Mm -hmm. in more interesting skin on it very simple procedure but what we realized was you know we weren't really coming up with anything that was all that interesting yeah And it was only a couple of us working on it at the time. So what we decided to do was actually get about 12 uh, team members involved. And everybody had three minutes um, to sketch, or sorry, seven minutes to sketch three different times. So three different schemes. Oh, okay. So what that means is, you know, 12 times three is 36 different ideas. Right. And of course, as ideas go, 
about half of them are terrible. Right. And, <laughs> uh, you sure. know, half of them are worth pursuing or at yeah. least talking about. But what you ended up with was about six or seven very interesting schemes that we ended up pitching uh, to this company. Mm. And they were actually really interested in the fact that we did this and sort of engage a larger team. Yeah. So what was that? 21 minutes of labor. And yeah. then there was, um, you know, a little bit of chit chat about the schemes afterwards. All, all told, it was about an hour. And so when you think about how you can drive really good content in only an hour, for um, sure, those kind of challenges are really interesting. But what it takes is just a little bit of planning and foresight to make those kinds of activities happen. And then, uh, so that would be on a group level. Yeah. On a personal level, what I've always heard from uh, professors that really inspired me is they said, switch media. Um, some said, mm. you know, um, if you're working on with pen, you know, switch to a pencil or vice versa, switch scale. So if you're working on a detail, you know, zoom out and go to the bigger picture. Some, some said, just turn the drawing upside down. Yep. So if it was a plan, literally turn the thing upside down on, on its head. And if you're working in the computer, get out of the computer and sketch something. Yeah. And so that's the thing to do. What you never want to find yourself in is a situation where you're spending an hour and not getting anywhere. Yeah. And so you get better at identifying, okay, am I going in, in a bad path? And if so, you just switch it. And yeah. It, and it really opens you up for the most part. Okay. Well, then along that line, tell me something mm -hmm. that you do or enjoy that has mm -hmm. nothing to do with architecture. Well, like recently for me, it's been golf. Oh, really? And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I at least play or practice about once a week. Okay. And uh, for me, you know, I don't listen to music or anything like that. Like, say, if I go out to the driving range yeah. uh, on Saturday or Sunday morning, um, it's just me for about two or three hours yeah. just hitting hitting a golf ball. And, you know, you push your golf, uh, golf club into the ground yep. and the ball just flies into yeah. space. And that's a really gratifying feeling. And just tweaking like little subtle things in your swing and your mindset produces just slightly different outcomes. And for me, it's, it's a really good way to at the same time, focus on something. Yeah. But at the same time you let your brain just kind Kinda of wander. Yeah. You just let it wander. Everything just kind of falls away and it's a really good way to relax and get a little bit of exercise at least. I, that's, that's uh that's driving for me. I yeah. love to drive, especially mm -hmm. like on long road trips because yeah. my hands and hopefully my feet and my <laughs> yeah. eyes are kind of paying attention to uh -huh. what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but my brain's allowing just to kind of wander a little yeah. bit. And that's where I, I kind of start to think about things. Um, tell me about some of the design influences in your life. Well, you know, going back again, you know, I was talking about drawing and, you know, making stuff out of clay when I was a little kid. Yeah. But I remember maybe being 12 or something like that. And uh, the Air Jordans came out. Yeah. <laughs> well, they came out before I recognized them, but it was maybe generation four or something. And I remember I begged my mom for a pair of Air Jordans <laughs> yeah. and they were like the coolest things I'd ever seen in my life. Yep. And I remember like the netting. I just kept like, you know, looking and staring at these shoes and then I got fascinated by all the other shoes, like Charles Barkley would come out with some, Sean Kemp or whoever. Yep. And I would just like be uh, at the mall and I'd just be staring at the ground and my parents would like kind of get on to me, yeah. get on to me, <laughs> but, but it's because I was looking at other people's shoes. Yeah. And then like I would start drawing shoes and I kind of wanted to be a shoe designer because cool. it's, there are these little 3D objects that... Yeah they relate to a function, but at the same time, they're very artistic. Right. And so like Tinker Hatfield, he mm -hmm. did a lot of those uh, early shoe designs for Nike. So that's sort of the sort of, you know, non architecture, but then for architecture, um, have you heard of Tadao Ando? He's a no. Japanese architect, Okay. but I've gone over and looked at his stuff a couple times. Yeah. And the thing I really like about what he does is he just designs with like the bare minimum components. So he thinks about architecture as, hey, it's just walls defining space. Right. And all of his buildings are very austere. They're very elemental, which I think for some people, they feel a little cold for that reason. But the way he plays with light and just plays with mm. space with very simple elements to me is really beautiful. So did you get the Air Jordans? I did. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> as a kid, I did get them. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's uh, a straighter path to understand mm -hmm. how um, you would be able to influence design mm -hmm. in the commercial sector because okay. of headquarters and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, data centers is a little mm -hmm. bit different, but it sounds yeah. like it's kind of having a revolution of its own because typically they've, it's the the goal 
of the data center is to be as inconspicuous as possible. Oh, right? yeah. It's, yeah. It's behind a security fence, yeah. and that's kind of changing a little bit. It's changing. And uh, if you think about these big companies who take on uh, these data center uh, buildings, you know, uh, you think about recruiting, retention. Sure. So it's not as if there's only one or two folks in these facilities. There can be hundreds yeah. uh, in these larger facilities. And the thing about it is this technical talent especially say if you're in some smaller area, like maybe in Iowa or something, right. maybe not near a, a center of population to get folks to come and work at these um, buildings is not, is not an easy task. So you really need to attract them with the best facilities. Mm -hmm. So there's that component, but then on top of that, these data centers, because uh, they want to be as close to where the data, uh, you know, is zipping around as possible. Sure. So they're, they're really not just out in these remote locations anymore. They're dragging themselves closer and closer to city centers. And so with more eyes on them and more people understanding what data centers are, there are more regulations, you know, just from a, um, you know, a code point of view sure. uh, and just thinking about the local jurisdiction and, you know, how many windows do these buildings need to have silly things like that right. or what materials they need to have. And um, just their presence in the civic realm is now something that people actually talk about and are concerned yeah. about. And so what that means is we always have to up our game to consider, you know, what is the design of these buildings like for the cities that they're near, but then also the people that they're trying to attract. That's got to be a, a really cha uh, challenging ba balance to strike because, mm -hmm. you know, at least in the the data centers that I've had the opportunity to tour, mm -hmm. they're I mean they're made to be bunkers like they security are. zero windows. Yep. You're looking yep. for fault points, all of that, mm -hmm. and trying to balance that with something that does look good and might mm -hmm. have windows or you know other aesthetic features yep. in a city center. Yep. that's going to be kind of tough to to work through. It can be tough. The good part about it is that there's always an office component mm -hmm. uh, as a part of these. And most of the time, these office uh, areas, they can have much more natural light. Sure. The good thing about them too, typically the way they're planned is they're fairly shallow. So they have the ability to harvest lots of really beautiful natural light. They also usually have a pretty high floor to floor, mm. which means that you can get some pretty interesting spatial drama within the buildings. And that also encourages more light. So just due to the very nature of the way they're typically site planned, you can actually get some really beautiful spaces. And then and the, there's also the level of competition. So if, if one data center company is producing these amazing buildings on one side of the fence, and then another is kind of lagging behind, yeah. you know, this one over here to attract that next hyperscaler really needs to sort of jump in the boat of design. Yeah. Otherwise, they're really just going to get kind of pushed to, to the periphery. Yeah. They, got, they have to up their own game. So um, it, you've been an architect for how long now? Well, since 05. Wow. So, so I'd have to do the math. So almost yeah. 20 years. Yeah. Um, what's, a, what's, what's something, what's a piece of advice that you'd wish mm -hmm. you'd been given early on? Wow. So when I was a young kid... Just thinking about, so you're thinking about the Corey who was just coming out of undergrad, for example. Sure, yeah. Well, I, you know, honestly, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to be an architect, even when I was in undergrad. And I'd mentioned before that I did an internship for a semester right. in, in undergrad. And I was talking to a professor and um, I said, you know, I love studio, but I've heard that actually working as an architect is quite different. Mm -hmm. She says, yes, it is. It's quite different. And I said, well, how am I supposed to know if what I'm studying is something I'm actually going to enjoy? Yeah, it's a and great so question. She said, well, go work in an office. She said, shut it down for a semester and just go find work somewhere. And um, I remember uh, applying to Lake Flato. She recommended uh, trying them out. And uh, I remember I was like the first one to apply because I was applying like not for a summer internship. Right. It was like for a whole semester. And anyway, so I was lucky enough to like get that experience and uh so anyway what i'm getting at is that was a very different firm than corgan mm -hmm. and i've also been able to work at a couple other firms in the meantime and so what i would say to a younger architect is get as much real experience as possible mm -hmm. if you're just coming out of school because it's not only are you going to love the profession but what kind of office do you really want to work in mm -hmm. some offices are much more casual some are much more professional some have, you know, all the tools and resources, you know, like we have here. Right. And then some, you're your own IT department. Yeah. Or 
I mean, in one case in Portugal, I was working on a pirated version of AutoCAD, you know, <laughs> and sometimes my computer would shut down, you know, and, and we'd have to figure that out. No air conditioning, but yeah. it was also an amazing place to work. Yeah. And so I can't really say that that was a bad experience. Yeah. It was an awesome experience, but you're just getting different things out of it. So tell me a little bit about working in Portugal. That mm -hmm. why Portugal? And that's kind of a, an interesting mm -hmm juxtaposition to the type of work you do now. Yeah. So, uh, when I was in grad school at UT, uh, they have a, uh, residency program is what they call it. And anyway, what they do is they set you up, uh, with an office overseas, or it could be even a really acclaimed national firm. Uh, they've sent people to Renzo Piano's office and, you know, a number of offices around the world. And they actually didn't have a relationship with this, uh, office in Portugal. It's called Aris Mateus. And, but the, the issue is I had a friend who had been over there working for a different firm and he had mentioned it as a really interesting hyper contemporary firm. And the, the reason, um, I was super interested in them is they do these really alien looking buildings out in the <laughs> landscape. They're just these white kind of cubic volumes that yeah. then they carve into. And what I did there, you know, besides doing drawings and renderings sure. and stuff, was we set at a table and it was me and this girl from Japan and this guy from Italy, a big table like this. And we had these wire foam cutters and we started off with these big chunks of foam yeah. and we'd just send them through the wire and cut them down. And then we'd end up with these really weird kind of subtractive forms. And that's what all their architecture was based around. Wow. But you know, when you see these buildings, they look really exotic and you're thinking, Oh my God, these must be really crazy materials and stuff. They were just made out of brick and they <laughs> plastered over the brick done. I mean, it was the most kind of rudimentary construction, yeah. but what they produced were these really beautiful, uh, forms. How do you feel like that influenced design mm -hmm. for you now? Yeah. Well, a lot of times, uh, when I thought about design before going there, it was always an assembly of things. So mm -hmm. it might start with, oh yeah, there are these columns and then you have the floor slabs and now you're wrapping it with glass. And you think about like starting from square one and building up with all these pieces, pieces. Yeah, pieces. yeah, yeah. exactly. And then this was so different because you started off with this very kind of cosmic form and then you just start slicing and dicing it. And so it goes back to what I was saying before, where um, it's it's not like one way is the right way to solve a problem. Sure. I'm not saying like that is going to be the next big thing. But what I'm saying is there are particular projects that lend themselves to different strategies. Right. And at least having that strategy kind of in the mental toolkit amongst other strategies, I think is really beneficial um, to have. So that's an experience I was really um, awesome. happy to have. And um, living in Lisbon was amazing. Um, took about 30, 30 to 40 minutes to walk to work, but it was a beautiful walk. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, I lived with this guy, Javi, uh, who was from Madrid. So yeah. he's this, this cool Spanish kid. And we just, you know, walked and talked every day and got to know him real well, did a lot of traveling, uh, in and around Portugal, uh, went through Spain and did a couple of road trips around there. And, um, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Awesome. Yep. Are there things that kind of stand out to you as, I, I guess, um, design universals, if you mm -hmm. will? Because like you said, you've, in addition to a, a, a broad portfolio in commercial and, and data mm -hmm. centers, you've done aviation and you've done mm -hmm. several other sectors. Are there some of those universal design principles that kind mm -hmm. of stand out to you as, as things that are important regardless of the sector? I think so. One thing that buildings have to do is they have to filter you from the environment. And um, I think we've all been in those situations where, you know, you're walking up to a building that maybe you've never been to before. You're in a dusty, um, overheated uh, parking lot. And now you're faced with this long walk across the parking lot to the front door. There's no protection overhead. The sun's blazing down on you. You're already sweating. Yeah. And now you open the door and then you're in this like freezing air conditioned building. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think like, even though, um, you know, weather might be different from one place to another, our bodies are typically, you know, very similar. Right. Um, I know there are s subtle differences from person to person in terms of heat and everything else. But I think as long as you're taking care of the human body and, yeah. and, and your physical needs, um, I think a building actually goes a long way and also site design and taking care of that. So that, that walk, you know, that I was just talking about that's brutal, 
you know, if you think about items in the landscape, whether it's a canopy or whether it's a row of trees, sure. you know, inviting you into the building and then thinking about shelter overhead with the use of a canopy, or maybe it's a half indoor, half outdoor space that you're kind of being filtered through. So your body has a chance to start to cool down yeah. before you actually enter the air conditioning. It's not an abrupt change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we don't deal with abrupt changes too well, like mentally or physically. Yeah. So having the building, um, offer kind of that filtering is really helpful. That's, that's interesting. Yep. Um, tell me some things that have changed over the last almost 20 years mm -hmm. um, that have changed that you've noticed in architecture as a, as a practice. Well, I mean, we had this, we, we actually just got off of a meeting um, with members of the design council and Hugo just about 30 minutes ago. And it was all focused around sustainability mm -hmm. and about, you know, how um, how are we going to invigorate ourselves going forward and really putting even more focus on yeah. that? So I would say, and you mentioned uh, COVID and those after effects and how that relates to hum you know, these different human needs and wants. And I think one of the things that's really important is architects, professors in the realm of architects, uh, architecture, and then others we're very concerned about sustainability 20 years ago, let's say. Yeah. And so you learned about it in school, but it felt like it was something that maybe the architectural agenda, uh, it was, it was an item on that agenda. But I think now, uh, if you look at fortune 500 companies, um, but then also just people, um, who are aware of certain things going on in the world, sure. whether it be climate change or, you know, other things related to resources, now the world is much more interested in environmental concerns revolving around sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that, um, that level of recognition and understanding is really changing. And so I would say that's one of the biggest things is just, um, you know, that is a very visible uh, item to be discussed. And then even just the technology, you know, solar panels 20 years ago were, you know, almost ineffectual, almost a gimmick. <laughs> yeah. They were very, yeah. And, and, you know, you think about their yield versus yeah. what they cost. Now it's not at all the case. You know, if you're going to get to net zero, you really need to incorporate, um, that solar and, um, all the technologies that are wrapped around sustain sustainability are just improving by the day. And, um, so that's, that's really the biggest thing for me. Going back to your kind of personal career, mm -hmm. is there a setback or um, something you would have done differently that's kind of shaped mm -hmm. your your career as it's been? I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a huge negative because uh, I still appreciate it. But I had no idea coming out of high school that there were some colleges that did a four and two, mm. meaning four years of uh, undergrad and then two years to do a master's. And um, I just randomly selected A&M not knowing that they didn't have like a five-year professional degree right. that like UT and others have. And, um, you know, just me not knowing that just meant that I made one decision. Yeah. And I loved, I loved my undergraduate sure, career. Sure, sure. But at the same time, you know, it was a little bit less efficient for yeah. me to do that and then go work a little bit and then have go back away, yeah. and then to break away fr from uh, my career. At the same time, though, having, you know, that diversity of experience, you know, from two different schools, sure. faculty was very different. And so you had the ability to kind of toggle between two mindsets. And I think that's one thing that's really important uh, for me with this whole thing going back to diversity of experience is now I can kind of pull from, OK, if there's a certain design challenge, how would, you know, somebody at Corrigan, I could like maybe name somebody, right. how would they approach it? How would somebody at Lake Flato approach it? How would somebody uh, at Erich Mateus appro approach it? That's who I worked for in Portugal. And then actually had a little bit of ex experience with Hanbury, who's a company out on the East Coast, who does a lot of higher education work. So uh, you're able to sort of identify, you know, what's the kind of cultural DNA of that office and yeah. what's their approach to problem solving. And you can kind of look through those different filters to help you solve a problem. Well, and having those three years mm -hmm. before you went and got your your final higher ed it, it yeah. i bet that allowed you to kind of walk into it with more experience and a, sure. a greater appreciation of what you were learning there were kids there were kids that i was in studio with who literally had an undergrad in history yeah and they were suddenly starting to learn how to you know draw right. or even do sketch up or the simplest things that you would learn um on the job day one uh in a professional realm 
So for us, like us that actually came from uh, a little bit of work experience, it was a major kind of, uh, you know, it, it was this advantage, but at the same time, it allowed you to be more of a mentor for mm-hmm. those other kids who, well, kids, adults yeah. who didn't, <laughs> you know, who didn't have that experience. Yeah. So you could sit there and kind of teach them how to work through it. And they came with this like weird kind of like out of the box understanding and sometimes they would actually have solutions that you would never think of mm. because you're too close to it. Yeah. You, you, you knew too much. So speaking of mentoring, mm-hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about, I, I know part of being a design director is not just working on the project, mm-hmm. but also mentoring the, the, the designers and architects that are here. Tell me a right. little bit about that. Yeah. So, uh, we might find ourselves, uh, working, you know, on a project from start to finish and we might be, leading that project from a design point of view. Mm -hmm. The thing is though, most of our projects, because they're typically fairly large, they're they're complex enough to where, um, you know, these things need to be broken down into component parts and sometimes individual studies on, let's say it's a garage facade uh, or a primary facade or something. You know, we might need to have, um, you know, specific individuals chasing down uh, certain parts of the building the challenge there is you need everyone to be speaking the same language and understanding the design intent um, that was baked in, you know, after yeah. visioning. And so that's that constant communication that needs to happen. It just means that, you know, you're not just sitting at your desk plugging away, but you constantly have to be getting up and interacting. Yeah. And that goes back again to what we we're talking about before with work from home. Now, what does that mean? A team's chat or a team's meeting right, that you right. suddenly have to do it's way easier to just kind of, uh, do something like that in person. So, um, that's to me the, the challenge, but also the really fun part about the mentoring, um, element to this, because then, you know, you're over there, you're pointing at at the screen, you're having conversations, you're drawing, uh, with each other and you get to learn what people can do and what perspectives, uh, they can bring to the table. So it's really refreshing. All right, wrapping it up. Sure. Tell me a little bit about what excites you about the future of architecture. Well, the future of architecture is both exciting and scary because uh, if you think about from a technology point of view and the process that we use, um, you know, so much of it has always been driven by the individual's brain, you know, the human brain. And what you're seeing is the ability now for computers to actually take a much, much larger role. Right. And you think about AI and you think about parametric design and all of these things are both really interesting and also frightening to some degree because you think about the issue of authorship and who's actually uh, doing the creative work. Yeah. So it brings to mind the question of as the designer, are you essentially selecting schemes that a computer has already produced? Yep. Can you plug in, this building is 150,000 square feet. This is yeah. the parking ratio. You know, this is the program. And now computer iterate on a thousand schemes for that. Yeah. And I'm going to pick one out of a thousand for you to do further iterations yeah. on. So are you kind of just sitting there like waiting for this thing yeah. to happen? And in some ways it could be actually amazing because Autodesk, they did this, um, they did this thing where they took two mid-century um, modern chair designs and they plugged it into an algorithm so that they scanned it, they plugged it in. And I think the program was called Dreamweaver and they en- ended up doing hundreds of parametric designs and they were all carved out of wood. And they looked like, um, if you've seen Gaudi's work, yeah. uh, the Spanish architect, yeah. Uh, they looked like chairs that he would have designed. Yeah. They were just gorgeous. They looked sort of like bones. Um, so they looked anatomical to some degree, but they also retained some of that beautiful kind of mid-century design to them. And I think about it, and could a human do that? I guess some humans could, Yeah. but somehow there was this really interesting marriage between the folks that coded this thing and the computer that spit it out and then the folks that actually looked at it and selected the more interesting designs. Yeah. So I think we're going to start seeing that really weird kind of interaction between computers and humans, Yeah. which for me, because, you know, I, I'm not as technologically versed as, as some folks who are just coming out of school and certainly not like a computer scientist is. So there's that like space where I'm like kind of removed from that. 
And so there's only a certain amount of that that I can understand sure. as far as how it works. And, but I still know that the future means more interaction with it. So I have to be open-minded enough to accept that. Yeah, I th there's going to be a balance. I've, I have a feeling between it creating space, right, doing some of the check the box work mm -hmm. to allow you to be more creative. Yep. Um, I think we're probably still a ways off from computers having some sort of actual creativity, but, mm -hmm. but I, it, you're right. I think that's, that's, I haven't talked about any, that mm -hmm. with anyone. I think that's going to yeah. be a really interesting thing to watch. It's is how those things come about. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be amazing. Well, Corey, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I really sure. appreciate you taking the time. Thank sure. you so much for watching and or listening, depending on what platform you are viewing this and make sure to check us out next time.